Welcome back to Evie's Acres. I'm Evie, and today I'm going to share with you some of the plans we have for our garden. Previously, the greenhouse was located in that area that was highlighted behind our house, and now it's further away from the house next to the shed. Over the weekend, after my son and I mowed the lawn, we removed everything from the greenhouse and moved it to this spot in our backyard. We placed landscape fabric beneath it, and then I used landscape staples to secure both the fabric and the bottom frame of the greenhouse to the ground. My hope is that in this location, the shed will serve as a barrier that reduces the greenhouse's exposure to wind. I used cinder blocks and large rocks that I found around our property to hold down the plastic covering the greenhouse. Once that was all set up, I called on my son to help me move a table, a chair, my seedling trays, and other materials into the greenhouse. One of the things that attracted me to living in this part of the country is the fact that there are four seasons. Something I was not aware of before we moved here, though, is just how windy it can get. I really don't mind the wind, but this greenhouse was not really designed to withstand this type of climate, in my opinion, which is why I look forward to building a nicer greenhouse in the fall when the weather is cooler. Here's an overview of the supplies I'm using to sow my seeds, including trays, cups, seed starter soil, one of my seed containers, and that colorful paper is a calendar that shows the best times of year to sow seeds indoors, outdoors, transplant seedlings, and harvest in Zone 7A. First, I put the trays with holes in the bottom into the trays with a solid bottom, and this makes watering the seedlings from the bottom a bit easier. Each tray holds 32 cups, and I placed a total of 128 cups across the four trays. Inside this stainless steel bin are the labels, a waterproof pen, and a small hand rake. I purchased the bin and labels from Amazon, and you're welcome to check out the links in the description if you'd like to buy the same items. I'm pretty sure I purchased the handrake from Ollie's or Dollar Tree, but you can find them pretty much anywhere. Although the stainless steel bin is advertised online as a pan for kitty litter, I never used it for that purpose, but instead found that it was a great size for mixing seed starter, soil, and water before I placed them in the cups. I typically mix my own seed starter, and I'll review that process in a future video, but for the sake of time, I decided to pick up a couple bags of uh, the Jiffy Organic Seed Starter from a big box store for five or six dollars each. And that starter mix contains coconut core, peat moss, and vermiculite. I usually mix in some water before I place the soil into the cups. My apologies guys, I had no idea that the top of my head was cut off while filming this portion of the video, so I'm going to just speed it up and describe to you what I shared while recording it. Um, I generally do not like to wear gloves unless I'm working with something that has thorns or could sting me or has a texture that creeps me out. And the reason that I add water to the soil before putting them into the cups is because it helps me avoid underwatering the seeds after they're sown. Um, I have three main categories of plants that I plan to grow from seed this year. First are flowers. Some will be cutting flowers, but most will be scattered about the garden to attract pollinators like bees, hummingbirds, and butterflies. And this will be beneficial to the fruits and vegetables we're growing as well as for the pollinators themselves. The second category of plants that will grow 
uh, include herbs, which will be used in cooking for medicinal purposes, as companion plants for some of my fruits and vegetables and I'll also allow some of them to go to seed to save for future plantings as well as to attract pollinators. The third category of course includes all the fruits and vegetables that we plan to grow for food. So in the next part of this video I'll share the specific seeds that I sowed in this first round and I'll also talk a little bit about our chickens because they definitely seemed to want to be heard during this recording. So enjoy that. I want to at least get four trays sewn today. That's my goal. Yes. Okay. So, let's get this started. I'm really glad I bought them because this is turning out to be really helpful for this purpose of just preparing the soil before putting them in the pots. So, One of my roosters wants you to know it's a rooster. We have broilers, also known as meat birds, also known as future chicken dinners. He's one of them. And then I also purchased 12 hens, three different breeds, right? One is called Amber Star, which I believe will lay like light brown eggs. Another one is Leghorn, which will hopefully be one of the earliest layers and also one of the longest layers of the hens that we have. And the, those will be large white eggs. And then I also got Americanas, which will lay blue eggs, which I'm pretty excited about that. By the way, egg color has no impact whatsoever on the taste. so. That whole idea of buying brown eggs because they taste better than white eggs and whatever is just nonsense. It's a marketing ploy. Really, what matters is what the chickens eat and how they live. So a chicken that is fed really good food and is allowed to free range and have space and air, fresh air and sunlight, those hens will produce eggs that taste way better than those hens that unfortunately have to be stuck in a crowded space with no sunlight and eat, you know, unhealthy feed. So anyway, all this to say, uh, one of the things that Murray McMurray does, and quite a few hatcheries do, is they'll send you one or two extra chicks when you place an order, say for 25 chicks, they may send you one to two extras because they know that that delivery process, even though it's usually one to two business days, that sometimes a chick or two may not survive. So in our group of chickens, we received 20, 28, yes. So I had my 12 hens, I had my 15 Red Rangers, and I got those um, what they call a, um, run. <laughs> so male and female. I didn't specify that I wanted a particular sex. And then, uh, one extra. So, two of our hens from the original 12 didn't make it past the second day, <clears throat> which is actually quite normal. It's, it's, it's nice when none of the chicks pass away, but you know, it's, it's not unusual for one or two to pass away. If you had, you know, a loss of like five or more, I would be really, con really three or more. I'd be concerned, but no, it's fine. <clears throat> they, uh, they just didn't really have the will to live. Um, you know, my son and I tried to, you know, give them additional electrolytes and, you know, make sure they were warm and whatever, but they just, they didn't have the will to live. So they moved on. And so I thought that the extra chick that I received was also a hen because I mean, I don't, I, it wasn't a sex linked chicken, meaning there are certain breeds of chicken where you can tell just based on the color of their feathers, whether they're male or female. And this chicken was not one of those, this chick. 
So in any case, I raised the 12, well, now 10 hens together and separate from the meat birds. And this is in part because the first two, almost three weeks of their life, they're all eating the same stuff. They're eating the same feed to, you know, make sure they have all the nutrients that they need in their bodies. But because the meat birds are bred specifically to grow up for meat, um, by the third week, I switched them over to a different kind of feed. Um, and they, they grew quickly. Uh, yeah, I, in the next video, I will show you a series of pictures from day one to about maybe two weeks in and some more like recent pictures. So you can really see the difference in the size of these chickens. <laughs> like I was blown away by how big these Red Rangers got. And the thing is, these are technically what you might call dual purpose chickens because um, you know, the hens will lay eggs. It takes these chickens about 12 weeks to reach maturity if you want to um, to raise them specifically for meat. But, <laughs> wow, they're just, they're huge. So, all this to say, uh, it took a, a few weeks before I really started to figure out which chicks might be roosters versus hens. And in the last couple of weeks, it's become very glaringly obvious based on both phenotype as well as just attitude and behavior. Um, my goodness, one of the roosters, so pushy and greedy and just rude. So frankly, he had to, okay. And when I say rude, I mean, I bring them food and he would knock everyone. I mean, he was also the biggest one. And it turned out it was because he was bullying everyone, pushing them out of the way and eating so much more food than everyone else before he'd let them even get close to it. So he of course became the biggest chicken, the fastest. And because of his aggression, there were definitely some of the hens that were afraid of him. Um, and a couple of the roosters were kind of like, yeah, I'll stay away from that guy. Well, turns out his rudeness backfired, his greediness backfired because he developed an enlarged crop, which if you don't know, the crop is the chamber of the chicken's digestive system where food goes before it goes pretty much through the rest of the system. They don't have a stomach per se, but it's kind of where it goes to sort of get exposed, I guess you could say, to the initial, um, you know, grit and enzymes and things like that to break down the food that they consume because chickens don't have teeth. So they have to consume a certain amount of grit, which is basically just small rocks to help break down their food. Well, Mr. Greedy, Mr. Greedy Pants ended up getting in a large crop and because it wasn't going down like after about a day or two I was like trying to massage it isolating him from the rest of the group just giving him water trying to do all the things they say you're supposed to do well yeah, it's not working so he yeah he's been isolated anyway so the final breakdown <laughs> turns out of those remaining hens, which again, I mentioned we had 12 that I ordered, two passed away, and then we had an extra chicken, which I presumed was a hen. It's not, it's a rooster. It's a pretty rooster though. He's like gray and brown feathers, so pretty. But you'll see that in a future video. Anyway, and then of the Red Rangers, I was hoping I would have like 50, maybe not 50, 50, because there were 15 that I got, but I was hoping I'd have like eight roosters and seven hens, and maybe keep two of the hens for eggs, and then, you know, the rest would go to freezer camp. I have four roosters out of 15, which means I have 11 hens, and of those four roosters, one of them is Greedy Pants, who has a huge crop, 
and is isolated from the rest of the group because he refuses to heal. And so he's not going to make, I mean, he's not going to make it to freezer camp because I, at this point, I'm pretty sure he's, it's infected. Like it's been there too many days and it's not moving and nothing is working. So he still has a plenty of energy and waddles around with this thing hanging off of him. But anyway, maybe I'll show you pictures at some point in this video if you want to see it. Honestly, it's kind of gross and weird, but anyway. So now, yay, I'm excited. Okay, so here's what we're gonna do. All right, so I have a lot of seeds. I will start off by admitting that. This is actually a photograph container, like holder. You. <laughs> Back when people would print out, you know, pictures, <laughs> like four by sixes, this is what this was designed to hold. It helps to keep the seeds, I personally like them, organized. And I also like that you can put these uh, silica gel desiccant packets. They're just like the same little packets you might find in like things that are, you, you know, get shipped to you or you open. And they just prevent the containers from... Um, really getting humid because you know if you put a seed near some moisture and enough sunlight it's gonna start germinating and you just don't want that to happen when you're not ready to sow your seed so anyway so it's really great for that uh, another thing I like to do is not just organize my seeds um, into these containers I actually like to group them I like to group them by type. So for example, this particular container holds my different peppers. It has some tomatoes and it also has um, a couple of other items. I Well, sorrel is one thing I've grown before and it's, it's really interesting. It has like a kind of a citrusy flavor to it. If you put it in salad, it's really nice in salad. When I went to the Homesteaders of America or HOA conference last October in Virginia, um, one of the speakers there, or a, a pair of speakers there were um, Sean and Beth Dougherty, and they offered a really great talk about all sorts of things related to homesteading. And, um, one of the things that they talked about was how to grow food to feed your farm, how to feed yourself, of course, but also any animals that you have on your farm. And these, um, these seeds are really going to be super awesome. I'm not gonna put them in pots. They're really meant to be direct sown into the ground. So that's what I plan to do. But I just, I have them in here because it's the first box in the, in the box and I wanna make sure I don't forget them. Okay, and so the other thing I like to do when I'm growing things is I've learned you know because it's just myself and my son and yes we have animals but right now my focus is growing the things that we will primarily eat and then secondary to that feeding our animals as well because right now <laughs> we just have cats and dogs and chickens um, until we have other animals on our homestead that we will raise up for food or to produce food products like a dairy cow um you know right now well thankfully for the dairy cow we have plenty of pasture of grass for for that but in any case my point is i've learned that because there's just a couple of us here humans um i don't need to grow all 20 varieties of tomatoes that i think look cool because there are a lot of varieties of tomatoes that look cool and I've grown a lot of them <laughs> in the past, but um, I decided to really focus on, I think this year I'm just doing, gonna do six. Yeah, yeah, I'm gonna do, two, um, let me make sure. Yep, six varieties of tomato. So, <clears throat> and I, I purchased my seeds from a few different places. Um, one of those places is called Botanical Interests. Um, I can leave a link down below if you're interested in checking out what they have to offer. Um, but 
this first packet is for ox heart tomato it's a pole meaning it's an indeterminate tomato it's just gonna keep on growing but it looks really good um i think this will be a really nice it's an italian heirloom tomato so i'm really looking forward to that for flavor i also have another italian paste tomato called san marzano or san marzano um it's a pole roma tomato so it has that roma shape kind of cylindrical shape also from botanical interests and then um once again another italian i didn't realize they were all italian varieties but this is a determinant um italian roma tomato which means it won't keep growing indefinitely once it fruits to its maximum capabilities it'll stop growing and so i'm looking forward to this as well um, so, and then I also really like cherry tomatoes. I don't like all cherry tomatoes, I will say that. But of the varieties that I grew last year, was it last year or the year before? Um, yeah, I have from Seeds for Generations. It's a, a family owned company. Um, they have some really great varieties of seeds. Uh, so this white cherry heirloom seed these are they're, they're called white cherry but they're really just like a pale yellow and they're so good there's just i love it i think it's just perfect to snack on when i'm walking through the garden another one i like is called berry's crazy cherry this one i purchased from uh, baker creek heirloom seeds they're based out of missouri and um i feel like these these are probably the most prolific cherry tomatoes I've ever grown in my life and they just I really not had much problem with them at all um and they're just so easy and delicious and the chickens we had in Florida really loved these too so that was kind of an easy little treat for them and then finally I also have from Baker's Creek some Paul Robeson tomato and I I've tried a few times to grow this and I haven't had much success I don't know if it's just the way, I don't know. I don't know why, for whatever reason, cherry tomatoes seem to grow really well or grew really easily for me in Florida. I have not had as much success with the larger tomatoes, but I'm gonna give it a try again here. Hopefully that'll work out fine. All right, and then the other items that I have in here are, let me get my labels out of the way. I also have um, peppers. Now I have hot peppers and I have mild peppers or sweet peppers. My son loves spicy, 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 spicy food. I like a little spice, like a hint of spice is okay, but I don't like it when spice is all I taste. Like I want to taste the food. So, but for him, <laughs> in a separate tray, I will be planting. And these are just burpee, hot pepper, the hot salsa blend. I think I got this from Walmart actually. Um, so I'm just going to give this a try and see how it works. Um, I also bought from Southern Exposure Seed Exchange, which is a, another company that I purchased from their, um, jalapeno hot pepper. Yeah, it's just organic. Not every seed I buy is organic, but I figure if I can, I will. And then from Baker Creek, I also bought some poblano peppers. I figure this is kind of a nice compromise for us. Poblanos aren't really that spicy, but they have a nice little, you know, flavor kick to them. Um, I, a couple others I bought from Walmart. I think these are from Walmart. It was either Walmart or some other big box store. Um, is the burpee sweet pepper lemon dream because I just think it looks cool. I like the yellow. I like the colors. And then also their tangerine dream, which is going to be like a bright orange color. Um, Ashvarsky pepper, this is supposed to be a really good roasting red pepper. Uh, I've grown it before and it is very, very flavorful. Um, I only had one plant, I think actually at the time, but, and so I ate all the fruit that was from it, but I look forward to growing this again. I also have Pippin's Golden Honey, which uh, I purchased that from Baker Creek as well. Um, the peppers are gonna be different colors. This is one where I, I've seen the fruit start, but it just didn't fully come to fruition. I do 
believe that when we were in Florida, one of the challenges we had was with pollinators. And even though I, I planted flowers, I don't think, I just don't think I had enough. So that's one of the reasons why flowers are a big deal for me this year going forward. And then the last pepper I have here is a uh, sugar rush peach, which is another heirloom seed from Baker Creek. Um, it's a supposed to be a hot pepper, but also have some like sweet tropical flavor to it. Um, this is one of those that for whatever reason I couldn't get to Germany when we were in Florida, but again, I'm hopeful that this will work this time around. So I'm going to start with these seeds for now. And really my goal is to focus on just, you know, getting four of these, what are they called? Oops. I'd like to have, you know, four plants of each if possible. So I'm going to go ahead and close the door because it's starting to rain. For the remainder of this video, you'll see that I'm sewing four containers for each type of seed. After I set up the labels, I use the pointy end of one of the labels to indent the soil where I'll place the seeds. And there was in fact a thunderstorm that rolled through shortly after I started this process. So um, at the end though, you'll see the four trays were completed. Remember to check out the links in the description box if you're interested in purchasing any of the supplies and seeds described in this video. I'll be back next week with more updates on the homestead, and until next time, 